against the ship. Fear whispers, screams, fall silent, hushed. Spewed from our country, forgotten, bound to the dark edge of the earth. At night, what is there to do but seek English cunt? Warm, moist, soft. Oh, the comfort, the comfort of the lip, the thrust into the nooks. The crannies of the crooks of England, alone, frightened, nameless in this stinking earl of hell. Take me, take me inside you, whoever you are. Take me, my comfort, and we'll remember England together. A lone Aboriginal Australian describes the first convict fleet in Botany Bay. January 20, 1788. A giant canoe drifts onto the sea. Crowds building on this upright oar. This is a dream that has lost its way. Best to leave it alone. Punishment. Was it necessary to cross 15,000 miles of ocean to erect another tide? I should think it would make the convicts feel more at home. This land is under English law. The court found them guilty and sentenced them accordingly. There! A bold died to them. But hey, only the three that were found guilty of stealing from the colony store. There, on the eucalyptus, the salt crested cockatoo. You've been made governor in chief of a paradise of birds, Arthur. And I hope not of a human hell, Davy. Well, don't shoot yet, Watkin. Let's observe. Could we not be more humane? Justice and humaneness have never gone hand in hand, Arthur. Well, I am not suggesting that the prisoners go without punishment. It is the spectacle of hanging that I object to. Governor, I suspect your edifice will collapse without the mortal fear. These men lost all fear of being flogged. John Ascot has already been sentenced to 150 lashes for assault. The shoulder blades are exposed at 100 lashes. 
And I would say that somewhere between 250 and 500 lashes, you're probably condemning a man to death anyway. With the disadvantage that the death is slow, unobserved, and cannot serve as a sharp example. Eddie? The convicts laugh at Angen, sir. They watch him all the time. It's their favorite form of entertainment, I should say. Well, perhaps because they've never been offered anything else. Perhaps we should build an opera house for the convicts. We learned to love such things when we were children because they were offered to us. Surely no one is born naturally cultured. I'll have the gun now. Who are the condemned men, Harry? Thomas Barrett, age 17, transported seven years for stealing one new sheep. 17? Does seem to prove that the criminal tendency is innate. Proves nothing. James Freeman, 25, Irish, transported 14 years for assault on a sailor at Shadwell Dock. Uh, Andy Baker, Marine and Leader. He pleaded that it was wrong to put the convicts and the marines on the same rations. They could not work on so little food. He almost swayed us. There's much excitement in the colony about the hangings, Governor. It's their form of theater. You cannot change that. I would prefer for them to see real plays, fine language, sentiment. No doubt, Gary yeah, would relish the prospect of traveling eight months at sea for the pleasure of entertaining a group of criminals. And the old savage? Well, I never liked Garrick much myself. I always preferred Macklin. I'm a camera man myself. <laughs> we need a hangman. Harry, you will have to organize the hangings and eventually find someone who agrees to fill that hideous office. Frightened a kangaroo. Oh, there is also Dorothy Angelin, 82. She stole a biscuit from Robert's sideway. Well, surely we don't have to hang an 82 year old woman. That will be <coughs> unnecessary. She hanged herself this morning. <laughs> Loneliness of men. Dread, my beloved Elisa, that I was walking with you. Oh, my dear woman, when shall I be able to hear from you? All the officers dine with the governor. I've never heard of any one single person having so great a power vested in as Captain Philip has by his commission as governor in chief of New South Wales. Dined on a cold collation, but the mutton which had been killed yesterday morning was full of maggots. Nothing can keep 24 hours in this dismal country, I find. If <coughs> I'm not made first lieutenant, soon <coughs> very. I saw the light in your tent. I was writing in my journal. Is there any trouble? No. I'll just, okay, talk, you know. Mm -hmm. If I wrote a journal about my life, it would take up volumes, <laughs> volumes, uh, my travels with the captain, the war in America, and before that, about my life in London. Not what you would call a good life. <laughs> Sometimes I look at the convicts and I think to myself, one of those could be you, Harry Brewer, if you hadn't joined the Navy when you did. And the officers may look down on me now, but if they found out I used to be an embezzler, Harry, you should keep those things to yourself. Oh, no. right, well. Well, I saw Andy Baker last night. You hanged him a month ago. He had a rope, well. No. He's come back. It's a dream. Right? Sometimes I think my dreams are real, but they're not. But we used to hear you late at night on the ship calling for your Betsy Alicia. Don't speak her name on this iniquitous shore. <sighs> Duckling's gone silent on me again. I know it's because of Andy Baker. I saw him as clearly as I see you. Duckling wants me, he said, even if you hanged me. I didn't want to hang him, Ralph. I didn't. He did steal that food from the stores. Well, I would have read the rest of the court that those men should be hanged. It 
know His Excellency would be against it. Duckling says she never feels anything. How do I know she didn't feel something when she was with him? She thinks I aimed him just to get rid of him. I didn't. Did you know I saved her life? <clears throat> she was sentenced to be aimed at Newgate for stealing two candlesticks, and I got her name put on the transport list. <laughs> These women are sold before they ten. The captain says we should treat them with kindness. Well, how can you treat such women with kindness? Well, not all the officers find them disgusting. Well, haven't you ever been tempted? Never. You know, His Excellency never seems to notice me. But he always finds time for Davy Collins. Lieutenant Dawes. Well, that's because Captain Collins is going to write a book on the customs of the Indians here, and Lieutenant Dawes is reporting. But I could write about the Indians. He did say we should do something to educate the convicts. Put on a play or something. A play? <coughs> well, who would act in a play? The convicts, of course. Well, I, I read the tragedy of Lady Jane Grey on the ship. <laughs> oh, it was such a moving and uplifting play. But how could a whore play Lady Jane? <laughs> Some of those women are good women, though. I believe my duckling is good. It's not her fault. If only she would just look at me. Once, react. Who wants to fuck a corpse? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to shock you. No, I have shocked you, haven't I? I'll get you. But is His Excellency serious about putting on a play? Oh, and the captain decides something, really. But if I went to him, I think... No. Harry, could you tell His Excellency how much I like the theatre? I didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you. But Duckling could be in if you wanted. I wouldn't want to be looked at by all the men. Well, if His Excellency doesn't like Lady Jane, we, we will find something else. Uh, well, a comedy, perhaps. <laughs> yes. I'll speak to me. I like you. Yes, it's, uh, it's good to talk. <laughs> you, you don't think I killed him, then? Ooh. Andy Baker. No, Harry. You didn't kill Andy Baker. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Harry, you won't forget to tell his excellency about the play. An audition. We are just looking for some women, Lieutenant. Here I am. Oh, I can play. I can play with any part you like. There ain't nothing for Meg or. That's how I got my name. Shay Meg. Well, the play has four particular parts for young women. Oh, yeah. you don't want young women for your peculiar lieutenant. They don't know nothing. Shut your eyes and I'll play you as tight as a virgin. You don't understand, Long. The play is called The Recruiting Office. Oh, I can do that too. What? Anybody you like. You want women? You ask me. Who do you want? Well, I want to try some out. Oh, good idea, let me Good idea. Now, if you don't mind. Long. We thought you were the magical. What? A pretty comb. You know, a molly. A girl! <laughs> you have no she lag on the ship, nor in either. On the ship, maybe you were seasick, but all these months, yeah. And now we hear you want a lot of women, all of us. Well, I'm glad to hear it, that I am. You let me know when you want Meg, old Jane Meg. <laughs> Mr. Clark! My colleague, Mr. Clark, is one called Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett, we have not had the pleasure of meeting before. Oh, I've seen you on the ship. Different circumstances, Mr. Clark. Best forgotten. <laughs> I was once a gentleman. My fortune is turned. <clears throat> the wheel. You are doing a play, I hear. Oh, Drury Lane. Mr. Garrick. The lovely Peg Woffington. 
He was so cruel to us. She was so plain. Oh, you, you say you were a, a gentleman inside? Top of my profession, sir. Pickpocket. Born and bred in Vermont. <laughs> Do you know London, sir? Oh, Don't you miss it? In these, my darkest hours, I remember my happy days in that great city. Drury Lane, the coaches, the actors scuttling, the ladies tittering, oh. the gentlemen watching, the clothes, the perfumes, the handkerchiefs. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Mr. Clark, you see the skill. Mr. Clark, I beg you. I entreat you to let me perform on your stage, to let me feel once again the thrill of a play about to begin. Oh, I see the ladies approaching. Oh, to Woofington, sittings. Ladies! Mr. Clark, I shall be in the wings. I'll be too, Mr. Clark. <laughs> Yes. Oh, here she is. The governor has asked me to put on a play. Do you know what a play is? Oh, I see lots of plays, Lieutenant, and so has Mary. Have you read? Yes. <sighs> Can you remember what plays you've seen? No. Oh, I can't remember what they were called either. But I always knew when they were going to end badly. How does this one end, Lieutenant? This one ends happily. Oh. It's called the Rooting <laughs> Office. Well, Mary wants to be in your play, Lieutenant, and so do I. Do you think you have a talent for acting, Brenda? Of course she does! And so do I. <laughs> I want to play Mary's friend. Sylvia, that's the part I want to try Brenda for. <laughs> um, she doesn't have a friend. <laughs> um, she doesn't have a friend. <laughs> Oh, well, Mary doesn't always like me. Well, the Reverend Johnson told me you can read in my Oh, life. she went to school until she was ten. She used to read to us on the ship. We loved it. It put us to sleep. Shall we try reading some of the plays? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for it. <laughs> Whilst there's life, there is a... Oh! Again, Brennan, that's good. <laughs> Whilst there's life, there's hope, sir. Perhaps my brother may read. That's excellent, Brennan. You could read a little now, but you read very well. Could you, could you perhaps make a copy of the play? We only have two. Oh, of course you can. Now, where do I come in, Lieutenant? Can you read, Bryant? Well, not those parts <coughs> in the books. But I can read other things. I can read dreams very well. Uh, I'm not sure you're right for Melinda. Oh, well, I'm thinking of someone else. But if you can't read... Oh, well, Mary will read me the lines. Uh, well, there's Rose. Rose! I like the name Rose. I'll be Rose. <laughs> She's a country... I'm from Devon. I'm perfect for the part. What does she do? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> she falls in love with Sylvia. But that's because she only thinks Sylvia's a man, you see, and, and she <laughs> sleeps with her. <laughs> and, and Sylvia was Rose, too. Well, like I said, it's complicated, but, but of course nothing happens, you see. Wait, it doesn't No. Nothing? Well, because she's only pretending to be a man. But, but of course she can, so... Oh, clear the flute. Well, she's not the only one around here. I'll be Rose. I'd like to hear you. Oh, well, I don't know my lines yet. When I know my lines, you can hear me read. Come on, Mary, let's go. Well, I didn't say you could. I, I don't know if you're right for the part. I don't know if I want you in the play. Oh, yes, you do, Lieutenant. Mary will read me the lines, and I, Lieutenant, will read your dreams. Bitch! Oh, Sally's mother! Melinda, right? Mm. Sylvia's cousin. No, no, you can't have her in the play. But why not? Oh, you don't have to be able to read the future oh. to know that Liz Morton is going to be hanged. Oh. I understand you want me in your play. Is that it, Lieutenant? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll look at it. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if a spreading supply ship doesn't appear, so it looks like we're all 
to be struck with a strict ring starvation and you want to play? Not putting on a play won't bring a surprise to run. And it was those kind of media's convicts to act in a play. The convicts! They has several parts for women. And we have no other women here, so... They're the thieving, lying whores. And now you want them to flout their pretty wares about on the stage? Well, no one will be forced to watch the play. <clears throat> this is a convict colony, sir. The prisoners are here to be punished, and we are here to match sure they get punished. We are here to supervise the prisoners who are already being punished by their long exile. Surely they can also be reformed. I don't see what that has to do with the play. Is it most passable to move? But it could change the nature of our little society. My dear Ralph, a bunch of convicts making fools of themselves. Mouthing words, written no doubt by some London ass, will hardly change our society. George Farquhar was not an ass. And he was from Ireland. Oh, good Lord, an Irishman. I have to sit there and listen to an Irishman. The play <laughs> propagate Catholic doctrine, Dr. Earl. The play is called The Recruiting Officer. And what is the plot, Ralph? Well, it's about this recruiting officer and his, and his friends. And, well, they fall in love with these two young girls from Shrewsbury. And, uh, well, after some difficulties, they finally married her. Oh, so it's sanctions, holy matrimony. Oh, yes, yes, you do. Sorry, silly harm. I was having such trouble getting them to, to marry us under this sort of cohabitation. Oh, Marriage, please. Well, why not a ball for the convict boys? Some of these men in a few years will become members of society again and help to create a new society in this colony. Should we not now encourage them to start thinking in a free and responsible manner? <coughs> but I don't see how a comedy about two lovers will do that often. The theater is an expression of civilization. We come from a great country which has spawned great playwrights. Shakespeare, Marlowe, Johnson. The convicts will be speaking a refined, literate language. It will remind them that there is more to life than crime and punishment. And we, this colony of a few hundred, will be watching this together. For a few hours, we will no longer be despised prisoners and hated jailers. We will laugh. We may be moved. We may even think a little. Can you suggest something else that will provide such an evening, Watkins? Well, I'm not sure it's a good idea having the criminals laugh at officers. They would only laugh at Sergeant Kyle. And Captain Plume is the most attractive and noble fellow. Oh, he's not loose, is he now? I hear many of these plays are about rakes and encourage loose morals. They do get married. Before. Yes. That is. Oh. And for the right reason. They marry for love and to secure wealth. Oh, that's all right then. I would simply say that if you want to build a civilization, there are more important things than a play. Here, here. Teach them how to farm or how to build houses. But most importantly, teach them how to work. To work, not how to sit around locking in a colony. The Greeks believed that it was a citizen's duty to watch a play. It was a kind of work and that it required attention, judgment and patience, all social virtues. And the Greeks were conquered by the more practical Romans. Indeed, the Romans built their bridges, but they spent most of the time wishing they were Greek. Are you saying? <laughs> are you saying that Roman to fall if the theater had been better? Well, why not? Well, in just a few hours, I've seen something change. I asked some of the convict women to read some lines for me, and it seemed to me one or two. I'm not saying all of them, but one or two. Saying those well-balanced lines, Mr. Farquhar, they seem to acquire a dignity. Or they seem to lose some of their corruption. There was one. Mary Brennan. Oh, oh, she read so well. Perhaps, just perhaps, this play will keep her from selling herself to the first marine that offers her bread. I speak about her, but in a small way. This could change all the convicts and ourselves. We could forget about the supplies, the hangings, the froggings. We could think of ourselves in the theater, in London, with our, with our wives and children. Oh, well, that is, we could... Transcend. Transcend. Transcend the darker. Uh, transcend... The brutal. The, the brutality. Remember our better nature and remember... England. England. <laughs> oh, where did the waiter to start to speak? It's a waste, an unnecessary waste. I'm still concerned about the content of the play. The content of a play is irrelevant. Even if it teaches insubordination, disobedience, and revolution. Since we all have agreed it can do no harm, <laughs> since 
because it might possibly do some good. Since the only one violently opposed to it is Major Ross, I suggest we let Ralph rehearse his play. Does anyone disagree? Sir, I think you're taking your disagreement into account, Robbie. Uh, the Reverend or Moral Guide has no objections. David. Of course, I haven't read the play. Davy, this is not an objective summing up. This is typical of your high-handed manner. I don't think you're one to speak of high-handed manner, now are you, one? Gentlemen, you? gentlemen, please. Your Excellency, I believe is for the play, and I myself am convinced that it will serve as a most interesting experiment. So let us conclude by offering our best wishes to Ralph on a successful production. I will not accept this. You witty, whiny, wobble with words, Greeks, Romans, what? This theater leads to threatening theory. And you, Governor, you have his majesty's commission to build up cities, raise up armies, administer a military colony, not fandangle about with some loody play. I am going to write the atmosphere about this right now, sir. You are out of turn. You are out of turn. I have summed up the, the feelings of the assembled company, Arthur, but the last word must be yours. The last word will be the play, gentlemen. Duckling, go rowing. <clears throat> it's almost beginning to look like a town. Look, Duckling, there's the captain's house. I can see him in his garden. Duckling. <laughs> the trays look friendlier from here. Did you know the eucalyptus tree can't be found anywhere else in the world? Isn't that interesting? I thought you'd enjoy Rowan to Ralph's Island. I thought it would remind you of Rowan on the Thames. Look how blue the water is, Duckling. Say something! If I was rowing on the Thames, I'd be free. Well, this isn't Newgate. Oh, I wish it was. Duckling. At least the jailer of Newgate left you alone and you could talk to people. I'll let you talk to women. Oh, Esther Abrams, Mary Brennan. They're good women. My friends are in the women's camp. No, it's not the women you're after in the women's camp. It's the Marines who come looking for buttock. I know you, Duckling. Who do you have your eye on now? Another Marine? A Corporal who, Duckling who? Oh, you found someone already, haven't you? Well, where do you go? Uh, on the beach? In my tent, like with Andy Baker. Hey, where? Under the trees? Oh, you know I hate trees. Don't be so filthy. You're filthy, you're filthy, you filthy whore. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Duckling, please. Why can't you? Can't you just be with me? You know I'd do anything for you, Duckling. What do you want? I don't want to be watched all the time. I wake up in the middle of the night and go there watching me. What do you think I'm going to do in my sleep, Harry? Watching, 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 just stop watching me. All right, fine. You want to leave me? Uh, go ahead. Live in the women's camp and sell yourself to a convict for a biscuit. You're filthy, opening your legs to the first marine. Why are you so angry with your duckling, Harry? Don't you like it when I open my legs wide to you? Then cross them over you the way you like? 
what will you do when your duckling isn't there anymore and to touch you with a soft fingertips the way you like it? First the left nipple and then the right. <laughs> your duckling doesn't want to leave you, Harry. I just need some freedom sometimes, Harry. You have to earn your freedom with good behavior. Well, why didn't you just let them hang me and take my corpse with you? You could have kept that in chains. I wish I was dead. At least when you're dead, you're free. You know Lieutenant Clark's play? Do you want to be in it? Hmm. Uh, Debbie Bryant is in it too and Liz Morton. Do you want to be in it? You'd rehearse in the evenings with Lieutenant Clark. Oh, and then he can watch over me instead of you. I'm trying to make you happy here, Duckling. If you don't want to be in the I'll play... I'll be in the play! How is Lieutenant Clark going to end with Liz Morton? The captain wanted her to be in it. <clears throat> On the ship, we used to take tan so you knew you could make Lieutenant Clark blush first. Well, you're not going to try anything with Lieutenant Clark, oh, are you? Oh, God, with that Molly, no. <laughs> you're talking to me again. Mm. Will you kiss your airy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come and watch the rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, I 
I envied you. I envied you. You read it first. Why? Because I want to hear how you do it. Why? Because then I can do it different. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to town, cousin Sylvia. I envy you your retreat in the town. Don't tell you, say it too fast. You can say it slower. No! You say it slower and then I'll say it fast. <laughs> no! Welcome to town. Why don't you read it? What? You can't read it. Oh! oh. I am reading Proverbs, waiting till midnight. The Sabbath, that I might kiss your picture as usual. <clears throat> Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. <sighs> Very hot this night. <laughs> Almost midnight, my Betsy, the Lord's day. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and the subtle heart. So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face. Sunday, took your picture out of its prison and kissed it. <clears throat> forgive me, sir. Please forgive me. I, I didn't want to disturb your prayers. I say 50 Hill Marys myself every night. Had it 200 on the nights when, when I'll wake up. What do you so, want? Don't worry, sir. I'll wait quietly. Why are you in the camp at this hour? Oh, I should be. God forgive me, I should be. Get back to the camp immediately. I'll see you in the morning. Uh, don't call me by that name, sir. That's what I come to talk to you about. That name. I was about to go to bed, Freeman. I understand, sir. And your soul in peace. I won't take up your time. I'll be brief. Well? Well, don't you want to finish your prayer, sir? I can be very quiet, sir. I used to watch my mother make her bar, so. Get on me, Fit Freeman. When I say my prayer, sir, I have a terrible doubt. How can I be sure God has forgiven me? What if he will forgive me but hasn't forgiven me yet? That's why I don't want to die, sir. That's why I can't die. Not until I'm sure. Are you sure, sir? I'm not a convict. I don't sin. To be sure. To be sure. To be sure. <laughs> it's just that if we're in God's power, then surely he must have sin. Take me, for example. I was born a good Catholic, and like all good Catholics, I was given a guardian angel when I was born. But what happened to my guardian angel, sir? Why did he stop looking after me? 
I think the devil tempted me mother, may her color so rest in peace, over to London, and both our guardian angels stayed behind. <laughs> Have you ever been to Ireland, sir? Oh, it's a beautiful country. If I had been an angel, I wouldn't have left it either. Why didn't you come here, for you? I'm coming to that, sir. Well, hurry up, I'm James. speaking as fast as James. I can for James, sir. James Daniel Patrick. After my three uncles. Good men they were, too. Didn't go to London. If my mother hadn't been tempted to go to London, then I wouldn't have been there. And I wouldn't have been there on that day. Do you remember it, sir? May 23rd, 1785. The shack If I hadn't been in London, sir, I wouldn't have been working as a coal heaver there. And I wouldn't have been there when we refused to work on that day because they were paying us so party, sir. And I wasn't even near the sailor who got killed, you know. The sailors shouldn't have done the unloading. That was wrong with the sailors. But I didn't kill them. Maybe it wouldn't blow, you know, just to show the last <laughs> I was with them. Even though I wasn't, you know. <laughs> and I caught five at random, sir. And I was among the five. And they found the cudgel. But I had that just to look good, you know. And they said to me, either you can hang or you can give the names. Well, what do you do, sir? What would you have done? Freeman, I would not have been in that situation. I understand, sir, to be sure. I only told them the ones I saw. I didn't tell anything that wasn't true. Death was a horrible thing, sir. That poor sailor. Freeman, I am going to go to bed now. I understand, sir. I understand. And when it happened again, sir, here! And I had such high hopes of making a good life for myself here, sir! Because I'm so friendly, see? So I go along, you know. That best, sir, I didn't do it! I was just there, you know, keeping a lookout for some friends. And they caught me. And they said to me, either you can hang or you can be hanged. Well, what do you do, sir? Someone has to do it. I tried to do it well. God had mercy on the whore, the thief, the lame. Surely he'll forgive the hang, sir. It's the women, sir. They're without mercy. They're not like you and me, sir. Men. <laughs> what I wanted to say, sir, <laughs> is that I heard the women talking about the play. Some players come into our village once, sir. They will look like the angels, sir. Like the angels. The way the women look to them with the light of a spring dawn in their eyes, oh. Lieutenant, I, I want to be an actor. <laughs> John Wisehammer and Mary Brenham exchange words. I will rather counsel than command. I don't propose this with the authority of a parent, but as the advice of your friend. Friend! That's a good word. Sure, but full of promise. That you will take the coach this moment and go into the country. Our country can mean opposite things. It renews you with trees and grass. You go rest in the country. Or it crushes you with power. You died for your country. You're thrown out of your country. I like words. What does indulgent mean? Well, how is it used? You've been so careful, so indulgent to me. It means ready to overlook for. I don't have much time. We start this in a few days. I have the biggest part. You have a beautiful land. There's so much to copy. So many words. Well, I can write. Why don't you tell up 10 o'clock? He's doing it. 
Ne! Um, I'm, uh, I'm... Afraid. Diffident. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell him. Well, I won't. My friend Debbie will. She's... <clears throat> Bold. Well, shy is not a bad word. It's soft. Shame is a hard one. Well, words with two L's are the worst. <laughs> Lonely, loveless. Love is a good word. Oh, it's because it only has one L. <laughs> I like words with one L. <laughs> Luck. Larvae. <laughs> Latitudinarian. <laughs> Laughter. Up, so 
inside me. Now let's go on. I can't do my injuries without my handkerchief. I've been practicing it all night. If I get my hands on that, it's you, you little pig. <laughs> I'm being melancholy. <laughs> I saw Mr. Garrick doing it once. This is what he did. And that it was. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. <coughs> oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. I think we'll just cut that line and go straight to where they're greeting you, all right? Greeting. Their greeting <coughs> looks like... like this. All right. Boom! And now I'll change to see the next line. <clears throat> my dear Captain. That's affection, ain't it? I might put my hands on my heart like this. And now, welcome. I'm not quite sure how to do welcome. I think if you just say it enough. <laughs> Sideway, what are you doing? I'm checking to see if you're safe and sound return. That's what the line says, safe and sound. You don't need to touch him. You can see that. Right. I'll check his different parts with my eyes. Now I'll put it all together. Bloom, my dear Captain. Welcome. Safe and sound return. It's a very good attempt, but it's it's very theatrical. Could you try to be a little more natural? Natural. Yes. <laughs> On the stage. <laughs> but Mr. Clark, you must believe you. Well, oh, Derek. Oh, after all, he's admired for his match. Of course. I thought I was being like Eric. Never mind. Natural. Quiet. Well, you're the director, Mr. Clark. I see this is a piece of, of theater. Yes. I've seen many pieces of theater on my beautiful island of Madagascar. And so I have decided to be a no piece of theater. Uh, uh, well, there's no part for you at the moment. There's always a part for Caesar. <laughs> All the parts have been taken. I will play a servant. But the Farquhar hasn't written a servant for words. You can have my part, I want to be something else. There's always a black servant in a play. <laughs> and that servant is Caesar! And so now I will stand just behind him and I will be a servant. Um, <laughs> there, there are no lines for Caesar. I will speak French! Yes, I will speak French! And that will make him a more high up gentleman if he has a French servant. Yes. And now. He gets the lady with his service. Very chic. Well, I'll think about it. Right? In fact, I'd just like to rehearse the ladies now. They've been waiting patiently, all right? Freeman, will you go and see what happened to all Scott? Sorry. Yes, sir. We'll come back to your scene another time, all right? That was very good. Very good. A little, uh, but very good. <laughs> uh, now we'll rehearse the first scene between Sylvia and Melinda. I envy you your retreat in your country for Shrewsbury, me thinks in all your heads of Shire are the most irregular places for living. But I haven't finished my line yet. Here we have the folk noise scandal, affectation and pretension. In short, everything to give the spleen and no 
your thing to drive better than the air is intolerable. <laughs>
Martin. Who was last seen in the company stores last night with cable? Liz, you will be tried for stealing from the colony stores. Do you know the punishment, Liz? Death by hanging. And now you may continue to uh, rehearse. <laughs> Betrayal, barbarous falsehood, intimidation, injustice. Speak English, wise Emma. <laughs> I'm innocent. I didn't do it, and I'll keep saying I did. It doesn't matter what you say. If they say you're a thief, you're a thief. I am not a thief. I'll go back to England, back to the snob shop of Rickett and Loads, and I'll say, you see, I'm back. I'm not a thief. They won't listen. You can't live if you think that way. Why you won't go back to England anyway? You're not English. I was born in England. I'm English. What do I have to do to make people believe I'm English? You have to think English. I hate England, but I think English. And him, Oscar, he hasn't said a thing since they brought him in here, but he's thinking English, I can tell. I don't want to think English. If I think English, I will die. I want to go back to Madagascar and think Malagasy. I want to go back to Madagascar and die with my ancestors there. It doesn't 
matter when you die. If when I you're died dead. here, I would have no spirit. There's no escape. This time I lost my courage. But next time, my ancestors will show me the way. There's no escape. My ancestors will help me. There's no escape, I tell you. You go in circles out there. That's all you do. Even a compass doesn't work in this foreign, upside-down desert. Here. You can read. What didn't it work? It says no. What didn't it work then? Because it's not a compass. I'll give me on the shilling to a sailor for it. He said it was a compass. It's a piece of paper with North written on it. <laughs> he lied. He deceived you. He betrayed you. Gentlemen, ladies, fellow players, we've come to visit, to commiserate, to offer our humble services. I get out! Get out! There's <laughs> Who has the play? The lieutenant is going to see the governor. Harry said we could come see you. The lieutenant has asked me to stand in his place so we don't lose any time. How can I play Captain Brazen in chains? This is theatre. We'll believe you. That's right. Where does Kite come in? Madam, we have brought you your fan. His Excellency exalts Ralph. I hear you want to stop the play, Lieutenant. Half my cast is in chains, sir. Well, that is a difficulty, but it can be overcome. Is that your only reason? So many people seem to be against it, sir. Are you afraid? No, sir. But I do not wish to displease my superior officer, sir. Well, if you break conventions, it is inevitable you make enemies, Lieutenant. This play irritates them. Yes. I don't Socrates irritated the state of Athens and was put to death for it. Sir? Would you have a world without Socrates? Sir, I... In the Mino, one of Plato's great dialogues, have you read it, Lieutenant? Yeah. Socrates demonstrates that a slave boy can learn the principles of geometry as well as a gentleman. Yes. In other words, he shows that human beings have an intelligence which has nothing to do with the circumstances into which they are born. Uh, <laughs> sit down. You must... It is a matter of reminding the slave boy of what he knows. His own intelligence. Yes, when he treats the slave boy as a rational human being, the boy becomes one. With a little more encouragement, he may become extraordinary. Who knows? You must see your actors in that light. I see some of them, sir, but, but there are others. How do you know what humanity lies hidden under the rags and filth of a mangled life? I have seen soldiers given up for dead, limbs torn, heads cut open, come back to life. If you treat them as corpses, of course they will die. You must try a little kindness, Lieutenant. Look, I, I want to rule over responsible human beings. Do not tyrannize over a group of animals. I want there to be a contract between us, not a whip on my side and terror and hatred on theirs. You must help me, Ralph. Well, yes, sir. The place. Yeah, I know it won't change much, but it is the diagram in the sand which may remind, may just remind the slave boy. Do you understand? I think so, sir. We may fail. I may have a mutiny on my hands. They are trying to convince the Admiralty that I am mad. Sir? And they will threaten you. 
You don't want to be a second lieutenant all your life. No, sir. I cannot go over the head of Major Ross in the matter of promotions. I see, sir. But we have embarked, Ralph. We must stay afloat. There is a more serious threat which may capsize us all. If the ship does not come within three months, the supplies will be exhausted. In one month, I should be forced to cut the rations again. Harry is not well. Can you do something? Good luck with the flight, Ken. Oh, and Ralph! Unexpected situations are often matched by unexpected virtues in people, are they not? Well, I believe they are, sir. A, a play is a world in itself. A tiny colony, we could almost say. And you, Ralph, are in charge of it. That is a great responsibility. <coughs> I will lay my life down if I have to, sir. I don't think it will come to that. <laughs> you need only do your best. I will, sir. Thank you. I will. Excellent. It's an excellent case, sir. I wasn't sure. Perfect. Good, good. I shall look forward to seeing it. I'm sure it will be a success. Thank you.
You're going to have to stand this. Please. Look, I, I, I'm not going to hurt you, Liz. I mean, not now. And if I can get the measurements right, I, I can make this quick. Very quick. Please, Liz. She, she doesn't want to get up, sir. I can come back later. Aria? I, I can't, sir. I can't measure her unless she gets up. I have to measure her to judge the drop. If the rope is too short, it won't hang her. And if the rope is too long, it, it can pull her head off, sir. It's very difficult. I've always done my best. But I've, uh, I've never hung a woman. You've hung a boy. You've hung a boy. That was a terrible mess now, wasn't it, Mr. Brewer? Don't you remember? He hung there for 20 minutes, and even then he wasn't dead. Uh, you remember how he danced and everyone laughed? I don't want to repeat something like that, Mr. Brewer. Not now. Someone had to get hold of his legs and pull on him till his head come up. Measure! Uh, well, could you tell her to get up, sir? She'll listen to you. Get up, you bitch! Get up! Now, measure her. The lieutenant's talking to the governor again, Liz. Maybe it'll change his mind. At least he might wait until after we've done the play, huh? I don't want to do this. I know that you're thinking in my place you wouldn't. But if I don't, someone will, right? Now be gentle, Liz. I won't hurt you. It's just wrong, Mr. Broy. This is wrong. This is wrong. It's horrible. <clears throat> There's no food left in the colony, and she steals it and gives it to Cable to run away. Now that's true, Liz. You shouldn't have stolen the food. Especially when the lieutenant trusted us so. Actors can't behave like normal people, Liz. Not even like normal animals. <laughs> Still, I, I'll do my best. I have plans. Are you finished? Yes, sir. I have all the measurements I need. Oh, wait. There's, there's one more. I'm sorry, sir. Liz, I'm going to have to lift you. I hope you don't mind. Ah, oh, good lord. She's so light. We're going to have to use a very long rope, sir. Maybe the picture would be better, you know. It's higher. Why don't they gonna build me some gallows, Mr. Brewer? Sorry, Liz. It won't be shame. I'll make sure of it. You can hang yourself. Come on, Freeman, let's go. Sir. You're very good, Melinda. No one will be as good as you. Mr. Brewer! That is wrong. It's horrible. You wanted me dead. I didn't. You shouldn't have stolen from the stores. Speak to her, please. What? Brewer, speak to her, please. Tell Lieutenant Clark I didn't steal the food. Tell him afterwards I wanted to know. Well, why didn't you say something before? Why are you lying now? Tell Lieutenant Clark! Another victim of yours? Another body? I was so frightened, so alone. Just get away! Get away! Death is horrible, Mr. Brewer. It's dark. There's nothing. First fear, then a pain at the back of the neck, then nothing. Brewer. I can't see. I, I can't see. It's dark. It's dark! Thank you. 
For I swear, madam, by the honor of my profession, if I ever had thoughts of preserving my life, was for the pleasure of dying at your feet. Well, well, you shall die at my feet or where you will. But you know, sir, there's a certain will and testament to be made before me. I don't understand why Sylvia is asked Pete to make a will. Well, he gives her his will to indicate he intends to take care of her. That's right, Lieutenant. Marriage is nothing. But will you look after her? No, Miss, too ambitious to marry Sylvia.